Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn into Matthew chapter number 27 and Psalms 22. Put your ribbon in at Psalms 22 and then turn into Matthew 27. Obviously, we're at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, we're right in the throes of the crucifixion and all that went into it. And uh, I believe the, the Lord would just have us to look and survey the, the wondrous cross. I was thinking about that while I was sitting there listening to their song and just thinking about the blood and thinking about how I have access to God. If the Lord was to ever ask me um, at the entrance why should I let you in here, into my heaven, into my glory, into my presence? I will be able to hold up this book and point to His blood on my life and, and think about the day that me, just a whosoever, decided to uh, trust in the Lord and His work on the cross. Uh, there's nothing that I could do. My works are filthy rags. Uh, I'll not have any other thing to say than I believed your word. And I've been washed in the blood of your precious Son. And, and that's all He requires. And uh, that's all He requires for me. But for the Lord, it was a great cost. And it's something that is hard for me to fathom. Um, I don't know about you, but when I open God's Word, I just feel humbled. Amen. It doesn't matter where you turn. You, just, you feel like God is stripping away your pride and revealing who you are and... Uh, I'd like to read in, in Matthew 27 quite a bit of, of what is happening here. If you look in verse 20, or chapter 26, you'll, you'll kind of just, if you skim over the page with your eyes, you kind of know what's happening here. He's, he's betrayed by Judas and he's forsaken by his disciples and he's standing there alone and uh, he's, he's arrested and uh, he's taken into the house of Caiaphas and he's falsely tried there and falsely accused and... Then you get into chapter 27, and you see things begin to play out. He's been denied by Peter three times. Verse number one, it says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they say, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Let these things play out in your mind. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they, they of the children of Israel did value and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. So we're watching prophecy be played out before our eyes. Verse 11, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then, then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast of the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I re release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Then the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith, Unto them, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? 
They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of serene, Simon by name, he or him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had I'm sorry. And when they were coming to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots and sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the the king, if he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let, let us see whether Elias will come and save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, and this is what I'd like to focus on this morning, and behold, or look and just take it in. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent and twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Amen. Let's pray really quickly. Lord, we love you and we look to you and thank you, Lord, that we can come to you through your blood, Lord. You've washed our sins, Lord. Those, every soul in here, Lord, that has had that moment where they've called on your name and and trusted in you and asked for your salvation, Lord, trusting in nothing else, Lord, they've been washed in your blood. We've been washed. And Lord, you give us just the privilege of opening this book, Lord, and opening our hearts and hearing your word. Lord, I pray that you would lead us in through that veil, Lord, that you tore open, Lord, into uh, your glory, Lord. Help us to understand what you've done for us, Lord, and the price of it, Lord. Help us to to just walk, Lord, with our imaginations uh, by the leadership of your spirit, Lord. I pray that you just take this service and let it be yours. Uh, We give you our ears and our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to preach this morning what God has just been um, 
pouring into my heart through this last week. Um, And the title of it is Thoroughly Torn. Thoroughly Torn. And there's several things in this passage that you see are just torn. And the first one isn't a thing, it's a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the Son of God. We see Him torn. And we're going to talk about that more in just a second. But if you just skim through uh, what we've just read, some words will definitely pop off the page at you. If you look in verse 67 of chapter 26, the word for me that just jumps off the page is buffeted. They, they buffeted him. They beat him. In verse 7, it says he's denied. And we see uh, Peter denying him there. And then if you move over into chapter 27, verse 2, the word bound. It says they, they bound him. They led him. If you go on in, uh, further in the chapter, you find him falsely accused and, and all these things and the, and the discourse between Pilate and the judgment seat there. But if you go on over to verse 26 in chapter 27, you see the word scourged. And crucified. You see the word stripped and plated in verse number 28 and 29 when they crown him with death and with thorns. You see the word mocked. In verse 30, you see him spit upon. You see him smoked or smitten. Verse 31, you see him mocked again. In verse 35, you see that he's not just led to be crucified, but he is crucified. Verse 36, it says they watched him. Verse 45, you see the darkness covering all the land. In verse 46, you see it said that he's forsaken. Verse 50, it says he's yielded up. And then you come to the veil being torn. And and so you see here many things being torn. And the first one is the Son of God. But then uh, immediately when he gives up the ghost, the Bible says that the veil in the temple, that curtain between man and God that separated us from the glory of God, that curtain that covered the Ark of the Covenant, that it was torn in twain from top to bottom. God immediately after the tearing of His Son and His flesh tears the veil open and then He tears the earth open. The earth is quaking and the rocks are breaking. Uh, the earth and, and, and the nature around it is, is shaking at what mankind has done to its maker. As the creator and the carpenter of the universe is, is crucified on the cross and, and he's torn, as his flesh is torn and he yields up the ghost, the earth quakes and is torn. Yeah. And then the graves are torn open. And You know, I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, but this is in my mind. I was thinking about this. Uh, You know, I can see him in my mind's eye being crucified outside the city. And and I stood at the eastern gate there and you can stand there. And if you look out away from the city, from the eastern gate, which is blocked in, it's, it's all bricked up there. You can't go in that gate. But if you stand there and look up, you're looking up at the Mount of Olives and it is covered with graves, above ground graves. And no doubt it looked different than uh, in his day than it did for me, but uh, that's where they buried their, their loved ones was there on the Mount of Olives. And they were looking for that prophecy uh, where God would raise up the dead. And can you imagine the earth quaking as the Lord gives up the ghost and all of these graves just outside the city there breaking and opening up and maybe bodies even falling out of them and, and bones being exposed. And it was like that. That was the scenery of the cross. It was like that until he came out of the grave. And then those bodies, many of the bodies of the saints, get up and go into the city and are seen of many. I mean, this is a miraculous moment for so many reasons. It's a wonder. I mean, it's a wondrous cross. When we survey this cross, it's the only wondrous cross there is. Uh, Every other cross is just a curse and and a horrific thing. But when we look at the cross, we can see the horrific things that are happening to our Lord. But there are some amazing things, some miraculous wonders to set your eyes on. It's wondrous because of who is hanging there. Who hung there? He's He's no longer there. But it's also a wonder because he stayed there. He he remained there until it was done and he allowed himself to be torn. And I want to just think about that thought there thoroughly and entirely torn. Just as the veil was torn from top to bottom, the Lord Jesus Christ was torn entirely asunder, his flesh. And I wrote that down. Uh, We see him torn in his flesh. He tasted death for every man. We don't have to go back through everything that we've read, but we can see him beaten and spitten upon. And we can see him crowned with death and thorns. And we can see them mocking him and disdaining him and robing him 
him and ridiculing him and, and doing all these things. We couldn't have handled even one of these things, but he handles them all. We see him led as to the slaughter. You know, we go into our minds, and I'll read this to you. Let this be in your mind. Isaiah 50. Three says that he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. That's a statement that my mind has glossed over so many times, but the full punishment for sin was laid on him so that the fullness of peace could be laid on us. It says, all we like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. And I don't think that it's something that you doubt at all, but the Lord Jesus Christ is torn. His, I mean, he's nailed to the cross. He lays on the cross. He allows mankind to slaughter him and to destroy his body. Isaiah 52 says that he, he was an astonishing sight, that his vis visage was so marred more than any man, that his form was marred more than any son of man. And so his flesh was torn and he goes through all of these physical pains and agonies. And uh, I was thinking about this. It was probably a lot like uh, what Jacob thought happened to Joseph. You remember when yeah. Joseph's brothers, they hated him. They despised him. He was a dreamer having the dreams of God and they hated him even the more as he told them of his dreams and they saw him coming to check on them and, and they decided, behold, this, this dreamer cometh. Let's, let's kill him. Let's slay him. They throw him into a pit. They end up selling him based off of just the compassion of one of his brothers and they take that garment of colors that his dad had made him. The Bible says that they tore it. And they put blood on it and they covered it in lies and they brought it to Jacob and they said, we found this out there. And Jacob takes that coat of many colors, just that remnant covered in blood, covered in lies. And he says, this is my son's. He, he knew the Bible says he knew it was his son's. And he said, surely Joseph has been torn asunder or rent asunder by evil beasts. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ was rent asunder. He was torn by evil beasts. And God the Father, uh, he knew that for a surety. Jacob finds out later his son is alive and was never torn uh, like the Lord Jesus Christ was torn. But the Lord and God the Father, he had to endure that tearing. Uh, if you look in Psalms 22 where your finger is, look at this. The Lord says it as he prophesies his own crucifixion. He says in verse 32 of Psalms 22, it says, They gaped upon me with their mouths as ravening and roaring lion." Christ said, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint and my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And he says, thou hast brought me into the dust of death. In verse 16, it says, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell or see all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And uh, I just, I want to take the time this morning to do what God has done with me and just show you the first that's torn and asunder here is the Lord Himself and His flesh is torn. There's no greater way that it could have been torn. He's nailed to the cross. He's stripped of His garments, stripped of His flesh, stripped of His dignity, and He hangs there in shame. And that's not the only thing that was torn, though. His, his fellowship with God the Father was torn. And God the Spirit. If you look there in Matthew 27, if you're still there, in verse 45, it talks about the darkness that comes over all the land. 
And those words are written. Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I, I want you to understand that his flesh was torn and his fellowship was torn so that the veil could be torn. He was alone. He was rejected. These words are not just something that he's going through just to go through the motions. He said these things. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he was utterly forsaken. He's hanging on the cross by himself. And uh, I know some people would come and try to protect the Trinity. I'm not saying that the Trinity was broken, but it's obvious that the heart of the Trinity was broken. God the Son never became anything less than God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, they were still the triune God. They had united with this cause to bring salvation to man. God the Father suffered as He sacrifices His Son. God the Son suffers as He is sacrificed as the Lamb of God. And God the Spirit suffers as He leads Christ through all these things. But there came a point where the Lord took, the Son of God took on flesh. He's the only part of the Godhead that took on flesh. He's the only part of the Godhead that came to live in man's body. He took a body to him. And he is, he is forsaken in that body. He's dying on the cross. And he's the only one that can suffer these things, that can feel these things. And when he says, my God, my God, he's speaking to God the Father and God the Spirit. Why have you forsaken me? Why is the sun darkened on me? Why am I hanging here in death? You know, and, and think about this. Every time the Lord ever asked a question. It wasn't because he didn't know the answer. He's asking this question for all to hear so that man can ponder the answer. Why was he forsaken? He was forsaken so that we could be accepted. He was forsaken so that we could be in his presence. You know, Don't let anyone cheapen the cross of Christ. He felt utterly and entirely forsaken. He didn't lose his divinity He didn't become less than a part of the Trinity, but he hung there by himself. And he bore the full weight of sin. Imagine the weight of that crushing down on him. All of your shame and my shame, all of our sin coming down on him. I was, you probably read about it too, but, and when I say this, I I do it with a lot of respect. I, I don't want to dishonor anybody. But I've read so much about the Titan submarine and the five souls that lost their lives um, in that vessel. And uh, I haven't read um, a whole lot of different things. It seems like everybody's saying all the same things. But um, I did see a story about, um, it, well, it was written by a submarine specialist. And he wrote what he thought would have been their final moments. And, and the Lord led my mind to this uh, in thinking about helped me understand a little bit what the Lord may have went through to some small extent. But he said that they're in this vessel. There's five of them and they're at about 3000 feet uh, below the surface and they're bolted into this thing. They can't get out from the inside. It, somebody has to open it with a ratchet from the outside. But they're they're bolted into this vessel, dropped into the water. They go down to 3000 feet and they lose electrical power. They lose communication. They lose engine power. And without those thrusters, he said, uh, looking at the vessel, it would have turned vertical. And if they weren't harnessed in, they would have been in the darkness and they would have fallen down into the nose of that vessel. And it would have just been plummeting down into the depths with no way to come back up. And they would have sunk down in there in the darkness for 45 seconds to a minute or so. And every second, the pressure would have been greater and greater until... They suffered that implosion. And then in that moment, from what I read, it would have been the entire weight of the sea on them. And the Lord took so much more than that. Because when you think about our sin and the shame of it, that's oceans and oceans and oceans of shame that came down. And that's what he's experiencing here. He's in the darkness and there is no communication and and he's sinking down into the depths of our sin. The Bible says that he became sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he's sinking down so that we can be raised up one day. You know, he's going down in that vessel and there's no way out of it. He's bolted himself in it from the outside. 
And he sinks down until he is crushed by the weight of our sin and shame. I was thinking about this. I think it's good for us to understand this a little bit. But think about Abraham and Isaac. That's that's really a picture of this, this time. God the Father is like Abraham and and Isaac is like the Son of God. And, And Abraham takes the wood and lays it on the back of his son Isaac. And he takes, Abraham takes the fire and he takes the knife and and they go up this mountain to a place that God has shown them, a place that is planned. And and they get up there and they stack up the stones to build an altar and they order the wood on top of that. And uh, he takes Isaac and binds him and lays him on the altar. And then he takes the knife out. And and we read that. uh, We've been in Genesis 22 so many times in our life, but we see him coming down with the knife. And as he's plunging down with the knife, God interrupts and says, Abraham, Abraham, don't don't lay your hands on him. He interrupts him. But can you imagine what it would have happened if God would have allowed him to go entirely through it? If God had decided, I will let him sacrifice his son and then I will resurrect Isaac out of the ashes and give him the promise. He could have done that. Imagine what Abraham would have went through. He would have experienced some things. Now, this is something that never would have changed. Abraham, even after he had sacrificed his son, was still, would still be the father. And Isaac, even after he sacrificed, would still be the son. There, there's no difference in their relationship, but there would have to be some moments there where fellowship would be different. Yeah. It would be silenced. You know, I can't imagine how Isaac would have expressed himself as he went through death maybe he would have shrieked as in fear as the knife came down he definitely would have probably made some noise as the knife went in his muscles would have cringed he would have probably convulsed some he would have had some experience of death like all of us do we would have he would have expressed himself in some way and and Abraham would have had to hear those things and and see those things and probably come to a place where he says I can't watch this anymore and he would have turned away as Isaac's life drained away But there would have been a time where maybe Isaac would have expressed uh, the pain of death and being forsaken on the altar and dying, uh, being the only one who's dying. But Abraham would have had to hear those things and ignore those things. And the reason I'm bringing this out is because I think God would have us to understand that his flesh was torn to the uttermost from top to bottom, but his fellowship with God the Father was also torn. And as God cried out, in his body, the son, there was no rescuing answer. You know, nobody, you know, he didn't allow Abraham to go all the way through those things, but nobody interrupted God the Father when he sacrificed his son and gave his only begotten son in love to us. Nobody interrupted him. And so we hear different words. You know, Psalms 22, you're there. Look at what Christ says. He's quoting out of this passage on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season am not silent, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about Abraham and Moses and David. He says, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that He would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Look at his words. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And I think it's important that we do know that Christ was torn. And because he was torn, because of the cost that we have looked at to some extent, that's why the veil was torn. If you look there in verse number 51, it says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent and twain from top to bottom. And so because the Son of God was torn in His flesh and and torn in His fellowship and totally paid the price for our sin, because of that, uh, He was able to immediately open up the way into heaven. He didn't open up the way into the tabernacle. He didn't give them access into uh, the ark of the covenant necessarily what he was doing is he was ripping that curtain in half saying the way to me the way to be in the most holy place is is made now 
It's there. It's in the flesh. The new curtain is the flesh of Christ. You can come through my son and, and come to the throne of grace and find your help in the time of need. And so because uh, that son was torn and because the veil was torn, we should be torn. We should be torn. You know, I've, I've told my teens several times, you know, sometimes you, you hear a message and, and God is just tearing your heart. Have you ever felt torn before? Sometimes, like, part of you wants to go over here and do this and be with these people. Uh, maybe you want to buy something. I don't know. You have this desire, and a lot of you wants to go this direction. But then there's another part of you that's wise and says, you know, I shouldn't buy that. I don't want to have debt. I, I really want to be debt-free. You want to go this direction, or you want to be with these people. There's two different directions, and you have these two choices, and you feel like your whole body is stretching, and you hear, like, the fabric breaking, and you, you don't know which way to go. You know you can't go this way and go that way so you feel torn and and I've had teenagers tell me before I feel like God is tearing me apart and you felt that too when God convicts you and brings that into you you feel like God is ripping you apart at the seams and I remember feeling that way when God was calling me to preach and leading me away from aviation it was like um, he was just destroying me and I've told them before if you feel torn it's because you're not torn but I want you to think about this. I've seen it so many times in aviation too. Like you see a crack or something. Uh, once there's at some point, there's a lot of stress on that material. And it, it is, it's tearing, it's breaking, it's cracking, or the fabric is ripping apart. But once it's totally torn, it's relieved. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it, you feel release, Re relief. And when God is tearing you, you have to decide if you're going to, let go of this and go this way or let go of that and go that you can't go both ways and God will tear you but we should be torn and by what I, I mean think about it the, the way is open the veil is torn you can come before the throne of grace with boldness the Bible says by the blood of Christ by a new and living way you can come to God with everything that you are and, and because that way is open I don't know why I'd ever look that way. You know, why? I, I just let go of everything over here and I want to experience the God who has saved me. And so I want to ask you that question this morning and give you a, a few really quick thoughts. I know it's a big introduction, but I want to ask you what God has asked me. Are you torn? Like, are you thoroughly torn like the veil was torn? Are you ripped away from the things that are keeping you from your relationship with God? Or do you feeling the stress and the conviction? You know, I, I would say if you're feeling torn, it's because you're not. Be torn. Feel that release. Feel that peace. You know, I wrote this down. Um, we should be torn from our transgressions. We should be torn from our transgressions. Ezekiel 18.31 says, Cast away from you all your transgressions. Whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Let me ask you something. If you're feeling uh, convicted in your heart right now and you see the cross of Christ and salvation and the way made and, and heaven and eternal places with God, uh, how can you discount all that and, and keep your way with sin and darkness and death and hell and suffering and eternal damnation and torment? Don't be, you know, stressed about those things. Just, just be torn away. Let go of your transgressions. Let go of your old life. Let go of your sin. Let go of your death. Let go of the penalty. Let go of it all. Be torn from your transgressions. He, he says it, cast away from you all your transgressions. He says in Ezekiel 33, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Listen to what he says he'll do. I know you have to listen a lot, but listen. God says, then, then will I sprinkle you with clean water. And ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh, a, a heart that's tender and movable. He says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. You know, be torn from your sin and where it leads. And, and quickly, be torn from your temptations. You know, that's one of the places I think we're, we're torn the most or we feel like we're torn. 
is when we're tempted, and, and you will be tempted even today. You'll be tempted to gossip about somebody, to say something, to backbite, to be in bitterness. You'll be tempted uh, to watch something you shouldn't watch or listen to somebody you shouldn't listen to. You'll be tempted to be unthankful. You'll be tempted uh, to gripe and complain. You'll be tempted to do a host of different things probably. It's different for everybody. But we all have our temptations. And in those moments, we feel so stressed because our old man wants to come back to life and do his will and have his way. And, and we, we want to do these things. We know they're, they're evil and they're wicked, but we have some desire, some pleasure for the flesh in mind. And then the other part of us that's godly and righteous and, and uh, is walking with God wants to go the other way. You know what he says? He says in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. What is that way? I'll tell you, it's the veil. It's been torn asunder. You can go to the throne of grace boldly, even in the midst of your temptation. You know, David said, he said, stand in awe and sin not. Come in before me and, and look at me, look at God, take me in, view my majesty, view my strength and my might, view my mercy, view my love, open up my word and let your mind go into these places, open up your heart and pray and, and come before my presence in your temptations. You know, he said he is the way, the truth and the life. Jesus Christ, the Lord, the one who was torn is the way out of your temptations. He himself is the way. We should be torn from our temptations. We, we should leave behind our transgressions and we should go and sin no more. That's what he said to that woman caught in adultery in the very act. He did not condemn her. He saved her life. And then he said, go and sin no more. In your temptations, you should remember what he did. You go through the veil of his flesh, the Bible says, and you see what he did. We should be torn from our terror. I'm just going to give you these verses. Torn from our fears. In Joshua 1, 7, he says, only be thou strong and very courageous. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Our hearts flood with fear. We're torn, worried. Should we do what God has asked us? Should we go where he's leading? He says, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Amen. We should be torn from our terror and our, our frights. We should be torn from our troubles. Listen to this, Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear. Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and are troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And then he goes on to start talking about God is in the midst of the city. God's in the midst of her. God is helping her. She'll not be moved, though the earth be removed. You know, we can be torn away and just released from our troubles and our fears. You know, and you, you can, if you want, take your troubles up into the throne room of God. And God will relieve them, relieve you of them for you. You, you go there and you see that he spared not his only son. He'll give us freely all things. We ought to be torn from our treasures. You know, that's the number one thing, I think, that keeps us from where we ought to be with God is we're so captivated by the things on this earth that we never are mindful of heavenly things. He tells us to set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth. He tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, we ought to leave our treasures and worship Him and be just captivated by Him. And one day He's going to tear us up out of here, right up out of our terrain. And, you know, I want to ask you, is that going to be the first taste of heaven that you get? We can have heaven in our heart today. We can go into the, the, the temple not made with hands in our spirit and in prayer today. We can go in there with our temptations, with our trials, with our troubles, with our fears, with, with all of our shortcomings. We can come in there by His blood and lay those things out and, and find grace to help in the time of need. That place is open. We can have heaven in our hearts even when hell is our circumstance. I just want to encourage you this morning. 
One of these days, God's going to tear us up out of here and change our bodies. And we're going to have uh, mortality is going to be replaced with immortality. And we're going to put on robes of incorruption. And we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And we're going to be up in the clouds with him. And we're going to be ever with the Lord and with all those who we miss right now. But we don't have to just wait for that day for comfort and help and, and the one who made heaven. You know, heaven's really just the wrapping paper around the one who is heaven himself. I want to end this message with this illustration and, and we'll be done. Um, imagine this, okay? Imagine that you move into a new house. How many of you have moved somewhere? Okay. Don't you just hate that? <laughs> yeah, I hate to move. It, you go through all the pains of packing stuff up, taping everything, labeling everything, and then a bunch of your friends come and just toss it into a truck and, and you drive down the road and you get, you get there and it's like you got different furniture. You're like, I didn't even pack. This isn't my truck, you know? You get to your house and you unpack all that stuff and you, you go through all of that. And isn't it wonderful when you get everything settled, you know, and everything has its place and you throw the last box in the trash and you celebrate, you go out to eat or something, you know. It happens like three years after you move, but you celebrate. And, but you get there. Okay, imagine that you've done all that. Your, your heart's at peace. You know, the next thing that you do is you start to focus on your neighbors a little bit. So you look across the street and... There's this guy uh, that's just camping. He's got a tent in his front yard. He's camping in his front yard. Really rugged, nasty looking, dirty guy. And you're kind of like, I, I don't really remember seeing that guy there, but maybe he's been there. And you come back later, you're going to get groceries or something. You're backing out of the driveway, you get onto the street. You start to pull out and there's a squirrel that runs out and you, you kind of swerve and, and move over. And then you're shocked because the man that is across the street runs out in the street, pounces on the squirrel, and, and kills it and drags it into his yard and roasts it. You don't even go to the grocery store because you're just like <laughs> mesmerized by your neighbor. And you look over the top of his tent and you see that inside through the windows there is a woman in there and she is cooking. She's making dinner. You watch her make dinner, you watch her sit down by herself and she's just like waiting there. And she never has any company. She cleans everything up and you see this for weeks a couple weeks and but you think I'm gonna ask that guy I'm gonna go over there and say what what are you doing every time you go over there he runs off into the bushes or something you can't get a hold of him. so you talk to your neighbors and your neighbors are like well you're gonna have to get used to that guy but uh that's actually his house he lives there like you see his wife she makes dinner she makes breakfast lunch and dinner for him he never goes in and eats you'll see him out there I've watched him for a couple years. He's just been out there in the cold, freezing in the winter. He's, he's sweating in the summertime. He's eating bugs and he's in rags. But I've talked to him before and you know what? He has keys. Like, he can go in there. She makes dinner for him every night. You know, that's the way that we sometimes live in our Christian life. God has given us the keys, the doors are open. He makes a meal for us every day, three times a day. He would feed us. He sits there waiting on us, but nobody ever comes. He calls us his bride. He loves us with a love we can never understand. And we're willing to just chase squirrels and, and run around and eat things that are scrounging in our yard. And we never live in the place that God has made for us and opened for us. Yeah. We can throw that in the trash or we can realize that that's where a lot of us live. We're the man who never lived in his house. When we're the Christian who never lives within the veil. God has opened up heaven for you. He's, his flesh was torn for me. His fellowship was torn for me so that I could have fellowship. So that I would never be alone. Amen. I would be accepted, not rejected. I would have heavenly places. I, I cannot convey to you what God has poured into my heart, but I don't want to be this man who has keys and never unlocks the doors. I don't want to be this man who should be married, but doesn't know the person inside the house. I want to encourage you. One day he is taking us up, but today he will take you up. Amen. Today he will. You, he'll give you new clothes and he'll give you a meal like you've never had. And conversation that solves your problems. Counsel. He's the wonderful counsel. You'll find out 
all these titles in God's word, you'll begin to understand them. You don't have to wait till you get there. You can know him today. You can stand with me this morning and I would just encourage you to come and just enjoy a, your place of fellowship. You can stand and you can close your Bibles and bow your heads and, and, and take this time to just thank God for the way being open. I haven't read the verse to you yet. But as the, the music plays, you can come and pray and, and just be with the Lord. But listen to what he says here. He says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. <laughs> Maybe today you feel torn. God's tearing at your heart and saying, you need to be saved. I did this for you. You know, he says, all you have to do is just come and pour out yourself before him. You put your faith in him. He says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go down in the depths for my own sin. God says, I already died your death. And I'm out of the grave giving you eternal life if you'll take it. You just come to this altar. Bow down and ask Him to save you in faith. That's what God's Word says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're saved this morning, man, thank Him. Don't let these treasures tear you away from His presence. Don't let your temptations, your fears, your troubles take you away from Him. Go into that place boldly by His blood. Lord, we love you and thank you for this morning. We look to you and pray, Lord, that you'd help us to have our eyes open and, and that we will look up into the heavens and just thank you and realize how good and gracious you've been to us. Lord, keep us and guide us, I pray. Lord, we want to worship you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see how worthy you are, Lord, how wonderful you are. You've been so good to us, Lord. Help us to live inside the place that you have for us to live. Lord, I pray that you would just drive us near to yourself. Draw us near to yourself. We love you and thank you for all that you've given us and all that you've done.